A couple of weeks ago, I made a video looking at the idea of buying a Chinese tourbillon and whether I would recommend doing so to anyone else. My conclusion then was that it's a nice addition to a collection, but perhaps more so for enjoying the complication itself rather than everyday wear. In this video, we're going to be doing some similar exploration, but this time looking at the idea of adding a Chinese mechanical chronograph to a collection. Should you do it? Now, the particular model that I'm going to be featuring in the video is a Suges SCH P001B. It's a swan neck mechanical chronograph featuring the Seagull ST1901 movement. You might stumble across this model while searching for the Seagull 1963, as it's often listed with that name and they share the same movement. Now, a lot of people would claim that the Seagull 1963 is one of the most iconic watches available from AliExpress, and I wouldn't disagree. It's actually an original design at least. However, it just isn't for me. I'm not a fan of the aesthetic at all. So, I'll be clear from the start, I didn't buy this Sujis model because I like the look of it, or because I wanted to wear it. I bought it because, at the time, it was the cheapest model featuring that ST1901 movement and an exhibition case back. This watch was the first that taught me a valuable lesson in horology. I am horrible at picking replacement straps. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, essentially, I don't want you to judge me too harshly on this watch. It's not actually a bad watch, but I've made it worse with the strap I've put on it and it wasn't really bought for the way the dial looks or the design, just for the movement. So, where better to start this video than with the ST1901 itself, and really the entire ST19 stable of movements. To really understand the ST19, you need to know a little of the history of a now defunct Swiss watchmaker known as Venus. I will very briefly paraphrase some of the major details here, but there is an excellent article on watchgrail.com that I'll leave a link to in the description going over the rise and fall of the company. It was really useful to me in putting this video together because without that article, I would not have realized that there are two watch brands operating under the Venus name. If you search for Venus watches, you'll likely end up looking at the brand set up in 1902 and run by the Schwartz Etienne family. It's a bit of a strange website that seems to be stuck in a time warp and doesn't appear to have a functional shop, so I'm not entirely sure whether the brand is still going. At any rate, this is not the brand we're after. You'll know you're reading up on the correct one because of the accent on the E of Venus. The start of our tale really begins with Venus producing mono pusher chronograph movements like the Calibre 140, which had a central chronograph hand, but a separate dial with hours and minutes at 12 and a minute track at 6. This was not only an unusual watch format, but the timing seems a little off as the Calibre was patented in 1931, but not used in a watch until 1935. That timing gap might go some way to explain why they then release another new movement in 1936, the Calibre 170, which was a significantly more modern movement and more compact as a result. A number of big brands like Breitling and Hoyer use the movement in their watches, and these models are easy to identify because they still use the 12 and 6 layout for their subdials. In 1942, Venus released the 175 Calibre chronograph movement. This was further adapted and improved in 1949. If you read articles about the ST19, you might assume that Venus sold their machinery and rights to some of their movements because they were going bust. However, what actually appears to have happened is that the success of their cam-operated chronograph movements and innovative designs like the Calibre 211 meant they needed to move to bigger premises and no longer saw the value in continuing to produce their old calibers. This is why, in 1960, the Calibre 175 ended up in the hands of Tianjin Seagull Corporation. So, Venus would have the capital to push on with their newer models. Seagull rebranded the 175 as the ST19, but even after a number of alterations, it's still recognisable today. The ST1901 is a modified version which hand winds, has two pushers, a subdial at 9 and a 30 minute counter at 3, it has a sweeping second hand mounted centrally, 23 joules in the movement, a column wheel and a 42 hour power reserve. 
The upgraded version of the movement also features a swan neck regulator, which is a component that can be used to slow down the beat rate of a watch by a precise amount to maintain it within a specific range. Before we move on from the ST19 calibers, I think it's worth mentioning that they aren't the only Venus lines that still live on today. As some of their calibers, like the 188, were the basis of the famous 7750 chronograph movement, which is still in circulation today. In terms of movements, they are one of the most significant watch brands that isn't a household name anymore. Almost all of the models that you'll see advertised with the ST19 movement feature an exhibition case bag, and I personally would try and avoid any that hide it away, as for me, it's going to be the main selling point of the watch. As these models come in cheaper than the tourbillons I mentioned in the previous video on Chinese movements, I think it's a fair assumption that this is actually going to be the most intricate movement that you can get for the least money. That doesn't mean to say that it's perfect though. Obviously, at these low price points, you aren't exactly getting hand finishing. This is a complicated but mass-produced movement after all. There is also an element of fakery going on. Those aren't blued screws you're seeing, but lacquer coated in blue instead. While some components have had a bit more care lavished on them, this is definitely not a movement that screams high-end luxury when you view it up close. Let's be honest though, why would it? The charm of this movement is its accessibility. Turning the watch over and operating the chronograph pushes to see the movement fully come to life is, to me at least, mesmerizing. While not as astronomically expensive a price gap as the tourbillons, a Swiss mechanical chronograph movement brand new is going to cost you 10 to 20 times as much given that you can pick up a watch with the ST movement powering it for around £100 on AliExpress. A lot of micro brands offering mechanical chronographs in the hundreds rather than thousands of pounds range are actually using the ST19 range of movements as well because there isn't really much in the way of budget alternatives. If you're into watches for the sake of horology, but aren't blessed in life with a huge amount of disposable income, a Chinese mechanical chronograph and tourbillon make for a really unique set of additions to your collection. They'll give you a window into higher end movements and complications without breaking the bank. So I feel that I can thoroughly recommend them with a clear conscience, especially if like me, you're only really interested in seeing the operation of the movement up close. Having waxed lyrical about the movement in my suggest for quite a while now, I do think it's pertinent to actually talk a bit more about this watch. Because while I can recommend getting a Chinese mechanical chronograph without second thought, buying this particular model wouldn't necessarily be my go-to. In my mind, when I saw the salmon dial, I was thinking of the Ferland Mari Havana salmon model, that excellent homage to the Patek Philippe 1463. I was also thinking about the Baltic MR01 salmon, and if I'm really holding out hope, I was thinking of the Datagraph Perpetual Tourbillon from Alangensonne. What you actually get, I can only really describe as orange. This unironically sits face down in my watch box so I can just see the movement. So needless to say, I wasn't that enamored with it. Although it has a different crown, essentially this Suggest model is exactly the same as the Seagull 1963, apart from the dial. As I mentioned before though, I'm not a fan of the 1963 either, nothing against it, just not to my taste. So I thought I'd take a little time suggesting some possible alternatives that are easier on the eye. Usually, my starting point for a challenge like this would be looking towards San Martin, as while their prices are higher than most brands on AliExpress, their finishing and build quality is second to none. However, in this case, their models featuring the ST19 are far too homage for my liking with a mixture of a Daytona with snowflake hands or a Speedmaster being the only real options as their other models all use quartz movements. So, instead, I'm going to make three recommendations. If you want something with the movement that's going to have a serious air of quality about it, I would point you towards the Gemini Series 2 from Laurier. It fits into my target range of dimensions between 36 and 40 mil, coming in at 39 millimeters in diameter. It has some impressive specifications and perhaps most importantly, it has an incredible original design inspired by, but not derivative of, three classic chronographs and it just looks so clean. It is $499 though and as a US brand, you're likely to have to pay import taxes on top of that if you're living in Europe. If you really want to push the boat out, there are other collaboration models that while even more expensive, look unreal. Of course, you'll be paying import taxes if you buy from AliExpress too, 
but the cost will be lower. Sitting below that, I would also look back towards Sugis with the S419 Chrono Heritage range. It has a chunky design language and the ST1902 movement that sits the chronograph hand at 6 o'clock. It puts me in mind of some of the Gikota models I discussed in a video a while back and comes in an RRP of 239 US dollars, but I dare say you could make quite a few savings on that. My final recommendation isn't actually a particular watch. It's just doing what I did and buying the very cheapest ST19 model you can get with an exhibition case back. Because really, no matter how you dress it up, the movement is the real star of the show here in my opinion. To return to the question at hand in the video, if you want a genuinely interesting mechanical chronograph movement in your collection, absolutely a Chinese one should be on your radar. But I wouldn't recommend the styling of the one I purchased, unless you literally just want to see the movement in action like me. As ever, thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful, and if you have, I'd really appreciate a like. And consider subscribing for more content like this. The channel is creeping towards the 1000 subscriber milestone and I'd love your help getting there.